The scriptures tell us of the importance of studying God's word. The psalmist writes, Thy word is a lamp unto thy feet and a light unto thy path. In another place, he continues, How can a young man keep his way pure? By keeping it according to thy word. We at Calvary Chapel Worship Center believe in teaching through the Bible in its entirety. May your faith be increased at the hearing of God's Word. Here now is Pastor Rich. All right, everyone. Let's go ahead and have a seat, please. And uh, take your Bibles if you do that. And let's open to 2 Kings chapter 11. We are just studying through chapter by chapter <clears throat> through the Bible, of course. And here we are in chapter 11, studying through... The, the kings of the northern kingdom of Israel as well as the southern kingdom of Judah. And so we're just uh, seeing God's heart as he reveals that. Let's pray and then look to his word tonight. Father, we honor you. Thank you so much just for revealing your word. And Lord, we understand that you revealed to us the heart of man, but also you reveal the heart of God. And so tonight we come with a desire just to, to receive from your spirit. And Lord, we know that the word of God is alive, sharper than any two-edged sword. And so, Lord, we pray that you would just move in our lives tonight with your word, knowing that you have given us the word as a light unto our steps. And Lord, we look to you tonight to be that. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so in chapter 11, we begin by the southern kingdom of Judah. Now, sometimes it's confusing because he kind of goes back and forth. And this is a, a, a common way of approaching it because he uses one to mark the other. So in the year of this king, this king started. You know, and he uses that back and forth. Now the trouble gets a little confusing because some of the names are similar. So we're going to go through, trust that the Lord will just reveal through it all and uh, just be blessed as we read through God's Word. And some of it sometimes, you know, when we're reading through and you see the heart of man, which is, is sometimes discouraging, you know, you, you, you go through this and, and, and you look for how, you know, how God is going to edify us in it. Well, God is revealing to us the heart of man, and that is a great thing for us to understand because it's a warning for us in many ways, isn't it? It's a warning for us, hey, be aware of the heart of man so that we would always keep our relationship to the Lord right where it needs to be because there the hand of the blessing of the Lord is in it. So in chapter 11, we're in the south, and it's an interesting turn of events because there's this Athaliah woman and uh, she is really going to turn out to be a very wicked woman. Now, it's interesting because she's in the south, but her parents are none other than Ahab and Jezebel. And uh, if you know anything about Ahab and Jezebel, you would know that they wouldn't exactly be your ideal parents. They are as wicked and despicable as they get. And so here the daughter turns out to be in the same mold. When Athaliah, the mother of Ahaziah, saw that her son was dead, she rose and, look at this, I mean, verse 1 just shocks us. So here's this woman, she's the mother of Ahaziah, she saw that her son was dead, the king, so she rose up and she destroyed all the royal offspring. Those would be like her sons. I mean, this is a despicable woman. And, and so she's just killing all the offspring so that she can be the queen mother. Okay, so that's who she's trying to be, the queen mother. That's kind of what Jezebel was trying to be. But Jehosheba, now here's an interesting thing. Even though she was trying to destroy all the offspring, God had made a promise, didn't he? He had promised David that he would have a son to sit on the throne. And so here all of these evil plots of Athaliah are thwarted because God is going to make sure that his word is accomplished. And that's one of the things that we need to really receive from this. God makes sure that his word is accomplished. You cannot thwart the will of God. And so we see this here in verse 2. But Jehosheba, the daughter of King Joram, sister of Ahaziah, she took Joash, the son of Ahaziah, and stole him from among the king's sons who were being put to death, and placed him and his nurse in the bedroom. So they hid him from Athaliah, and he was not put to death. So he was hidden with her in the house of the Lord for six years, while Athaliah was reigning over the land as the queen mother. 
Now, in the seventh year, Jehoiada sent and brought the captains of hundreds of the Kerites and of the guard. These are like the elite force. And they brought them to him in the house of the Lord. Then he made a covenant with them and put them under oath in the house of the Lord and showed them the king's son. And he commanded them, saying, Now this is the thing that you shall do. One third of you who come in on the Sabbath and keep watch over the king's house, one third also shall be at the gate called Sur, and one third at the gate behind the guards. You shall keep watch over the house for the defense. And two parts of you, even all who go out on the Sabbath, shall also keep watch over the house of the Lord for the king. Then you shall surround the king, each with his weapons in his hands, and whoever comes within the rank shall be put to death. And be with the king when he goes out and when he comes in. So he has his plan. He's the priest. So the captains of the hundreds did according to all that Jehoiada the priest commanded, and each one of them took his men who were to come in on the Sabbath with those who were to go out on the Sabbath, and they came to Jehoiada the priest. And the priest gave to the captains of hundreds the spears and the shields that had been King David's. Wow, that's David's stuff. He had, he had kept these swords and spears, and the Lord had a purpose for them. They were in the house of the Lord. And the guards stood each with his weapons in his hand, from the right side of the house to the left side of the house, by the altar, by the house, around the king. Then he brought the king's son out, and he put the crown on him, and he gave him the testimony. And they made him king and anointed him, and they clapped their hands, and they said, Long live the king. Now, when Athalia heard the noise of the guard and of the people, she came to the people in the house of the Lord. And she looked, and behold, the king standing by the pillar, according to the custom, with the captains and the trumpeters beside the king. And all the people of the land rejoiced. They were blowing trumpets. And Athalia tore her clothes, and she cried out, Treason! Treason! But Jehoiada the priest commanded the captains of hundreds who were appointed over the army, and he said to them, Bring her out. Bring her out between the ranks, and whoever follows her, put to death with the sword. So the priest said, Let her not be put to death in the house of the Lord. So they seized her. When she arrived at the horse's entrance of the king's house, she was put to death there. So Jehoiada made a covenant between Jehovah and the king and the people that they should be the Lord's people. Now, I, got, I love this verse right here. To me, I got this one highlighted because this is really, this is really, I think, describing how we should even be. It says, he made a covenant between the Lord and the king and the people that they should be the Lord's people. Also, between the king and the people that they should have a relationship together. And I, I think that's really a great understanding. We are the Lord's people. You know, who, who are you? You're the Lord's people. And, and I love that picture because he's got this covenant that he made. You know, when we do weddings, we, we of course, make a covenant in a marriage covenant. But one of the things that, that I like to do in a wedding is to start it this way. I, we always start with the group, I, so-and-so, make a covenant with God. See, I love to start with that because I want us all to understand that we really have a covenant with the Lord in what we do, that we walk before the Lord, we live before the Lord, we, in the Lord we have our, our being, and so therefore we have a covenant with God. And so do we have a covenant with God? We do. It's the new covenant under the blood of Jesus Christ. The blood by which God demonstrated his love toward us. How much did God love us? He loved us so much that Christ died for us even while we were his enemies, when we were sinners. So he loved us. That was his covenant to us. I have loved you with an everlasting love. And I've demonstrated that love through the death, the blood of Jesus Christ. And then we have a covenant back. We love you, Lord. See, love is a very important part of this. We are the Lord's people. We love you, Lord. We love why? Because he first loved us and demonstrated to us that now we can have a relationship to the everlasting God. This is what God desires. I want to walk with you. I want to have a relationship. I want to have a fellowship with you. You know, we love to eat together. We love to have fellowship together. And the Lord would say, and I want to eat with you. Remember, I love that statement. I stand at the door and knock. Behold, if anyone would open the door of his heart, 
I will come in and I will eat with him. It's a way of saying, we're going to have a relationship together. Let's walk together. Let's live together. Let's have a nearness of walking in love together. That's the passion that God wants us to have. So I love that picture. He made a covenant. Covenant between the Lord and the king and the people. Now, verse 18. All the people of the land went to the house of Baal, and they tore it down. I love that. They get, let's have some revival. Let's have some revival. Let's tear down the house of Baal. And I just think it's wonderful. God was doing a little revival here. Tear down the house of Baal. And so they tore it down, and his altars and his images, they broke in pieces thoroughly. A little picture of revival. Going and taking down the, the things that the enemy has got hold of. Enemy got a hold of anything? Take it down. It's a great picture. Take it down. And so it tells us, and they killed Matan, the priest of Baal, before the altars. And the priest appointed officers over the house of the Lord. Let's go back. Let's start again afresh in the Lord. So he took the captains of hundreds and the Karaites and the guards and all the people of the land. And they brought the king down to the house of the Lord. And they came by the way of the gate of the guards to the king's house. And he sat on the throne of the kings. That's a nice little picture of it. So all the people of the land rejoiced. And the city was quiet. For they had put Athaliah to death with the sword at the king's house. Joash was seven years old when he became king. Chapter 12. In the seventh year of Jehu, Jehoash became the king, and he reigned 40 years in Jerusalem. So, 40 years in the south. And his mother's name was Zabiah of Beersheba, or Beersheba. And uh, that's in the south in the desert. Joash did right. Now, it's interesting because as he mentions each of the kings, he will, he will tell us whether they did right or whether he did evil. And I think it's important for us to note because you can mark each of these kings and whether or not the land was blessed. There's a, 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 a direct correlation between whether a person does right in the Lord and the blessing that comes with it or whether they walked away from the Lord, turned their back on the Lord, and then all the trouble started. Now, there's a great lesson. The way of the transgressor is hard. And we just see this repeated as a theme over and over and over. But the blessings of the Lord are readily available. In fact, the, the, I love that scripture in 2 Chronicles 16, 9. The eyes of the Lord are searching. Now, I love that view. The eyes of the Lord are searching. It means they're looking. They're actively looking. The eyes of the Lord are searching to and fro throughout the whole earth in order that he might show himself strong in behalf of those whose hearts are right toward him. I love that scripture. It's one of my favorites. I call it, you know, do you have any life verses? That's one of mine that I say, hey, let this be a life verse for me. The eyes of the Lord are looking to show himself strong. And he's ready to bless. He's ready to pour out the blessings of his mighty hand on those whose hearts are right. That's what he's looking for. And yet those who turn their back on him, the discipline of the Lord, the difficulties, the Lord says, okay, you, you know what? The, you will miss out on the favor and the blessings of the Lord. And you will find that when you go your own way and make your own heart hard, you will find that the way of your life becomes hard. Because it's the hand of the Lord. It's the blessing of the Lord that we really need. And so we see this over and over and over. So it tells us that Joash did right in the sight of the Lord. All the days in which Jehoiada the priest instructed him. Now, one thing was missing. Only the high places were not taken away. The people still sacrificed and burned incense on the high places. Oh, just a little more. So he's almost but not quite there. You know what I'm saying? Almost but not quite there. And the Lord wants us to say, no, we are holy there. We're all yours there, Lord. Now it tells us that Joash said to the priests, now see, he wants to repair the temple. It's been neglected and torn down. All, he said to the priests, all the money of the sacred things which is brought into the house of the Lord uh, in current money, both the money of each man's assessment and all the money which any man's heart prompts him to bring into the house of the Lord, let the priests take it for themselves, each from his acquaintance, and they shall repair the damage of the house wherever any damage may be found. So what he's really doing here 
And he's going to change the direction later. He, he's giving the responsibility to the priest. And he said, now each of the priests were allowed to have a certain portion as a person brought in their, their tithes or their offerings or their peace offerings or the goodwill offerings or whatever. When they would bring that into the Lord, then the priests were apportioned some for their own support because the priests did not have uh, farms, they didn't have businesses or whatever. And so that was their support. So he gave each of the priests the assignment, you know, uh, take and each of you take a portion of the temple and rebuild it. No, it didn't really work. Let, let's, let's go with the story. It came about, verse 6, in the 23rd year of King Joash, uh, the priests had repaired the damages of the house. So King Joash called for Jehoiada the priest and the other priests and said to them, Why did you not repair the damage of the house? Now therefore take no more money from your acquaintances, but pay it for the damages of the house. But the priest, and the priests agreed that they should not take any more money nor repair the damages of the house. In other words, they weren't the right ones for it. They got another solution. The Jehoiada the priest took a chest and he bored a hole in the lid. And he put it beside the altar on the right side as one comes into the house of the Lord. And the priest who guarded the threshold put in it all the money which was brought into the house of the Lord. So what they're doing is that now they're going to put it into a treasury. They're going to handle it differently. And when they saw that there was much money in the chest, the king's scribe and the high priest came up and tied it in bags, counted the money which was found in the house of the Lord, and they gave the money which was weighed out into the hands of those who did the work. And they had oversight of the house of the Lord, and they paid it out to carpenters. These are the ones that are going to rebuild it. Carpenters and builders who worked in the house of the Lord. Masons, stone cutters, those who bought timber and cut stone to repair the damages to the house of the Lord for all that was laid out for the ho house to repair it. So that's what they're doing. But there was not made for the house of the Lord silver cups or snuffers or bowls or trumpets or any vessels of gold or vessels of silver from the money which was brought into the house of the Lord. It was used for the repair. And they gave that to those who did the work and with it they repaired the house of the Lord. So they handled it differently and it got repaired. It got brought back Moreover, they did not require an accounting from the men into whose hand they gave the money to pay to those who did the work, for they dealt faithfully. They were honorable men who did the work faithfully, and the temple started to get repaired. And I, it's just a kind of a nice little picture of what he's trying to do to rebuild and to reestablish, because this is the temple of the Lord. And by the way, is there a New Testament? Is there a New Testament picture of the temple? There is. It's an interesting thing. The, the, the scripture tells us that we now are the temple of the Holy Spirit. We are the temple of the Lord. We are the place in which the Lord now dwells. And so therefore, it is important for us to see a similar picture. Hey, keep the house in order. And he's talking about our soul, our spirit, our lives. Keep your relationship, keep your house in order. Spiritually speaking, don't allow disrepair to come into your spiritual walk with the Lord. Stay in a place where you are always building and refreshing and always in a place of right relationship. You cannot afford, none of us can afford to neglect our relationship to the Lord. By the way, in the New Jerusalem, it says there is no temple there, for God himself dwells amongst his people. That's a beautiful picture, even of the eternal future. All right, we continue on. Verse 16, the money from the guilt offerings and the money from the sin offerings, they were not brought into the house of the Lord. It was for the priests, so they were taken care of as well, the work. Our attention now is turned to Syria. This man, Haziel, a very wicked man, Haziel, king of Aram, went up and fought against Gath. That was an area of the Philistines. And he captured it, and then he set his face to go up to Jerusalem. So the king of Assyria is just making swaths of destruction all the way down. He's even heading for Jerusalem. Now, Jehoash, king of Judah, this is what he did. He took the sacred things that Jehoshaphat and Jehoram and Ahaziah, his fathers, king of Judah, which they had dedicated, and his own sacred things, and all the gold that was found amongst the treasuries of the house of the Lord, and of the king's house, and sent them to Haziel, king of Aram, 
And then he went away from Jerusalem. Now, I look at this, and frankly, I see it as a compromise. I don't think this is what God wanted. And so you look at a man, you say, he's doing right things, he's doing wonderful things, he's preparing the temple of the Lord, but he lacks a certain faith to trust that God will deliver. And so what does he do? He just uses some of the gold and the silver and he gives it to the king. Can I buy you off? And it, it works and the king leaves. I think it's a sad statement. And so even though you see someone who's doing good things and his heart is in the right place, he lacks the faith to trust God completely for the victories that God would have. Therefore, he never really became a great king. He was a good king, but never a great king. You see what I'm trying to say? And you look at that, and I think, is there a lesson for us in this? Yes, I think there is. You can be, we can be a, a good man or a woman or a great one. And I think that the Lord wants all of our heart and fully trusting in the Lord for all of the battles, all of the challenges, all of the things that we face. And here he's resorting to an old maneuver that many of the kings had done. Can I just send you some money? And I think it lacks faith. God, I think, wants us to trust him for all the battles, all the troubles, all the challenges, and all the trials of our lives, that we should be a great man or a great woman. That's what it depended upon. Do you trust in the Lord with all of your heart to see you through the troubles, to see you through the difficulties? That's the difference maker right there. It's faith, isn't it? I trust in the Lord in all of the battles and the trials of my life. I'll walk with God through each of those battles. That's what makes a man or a woman great. Faith and trust in the Lord through the battles of our lives. Amen? All right. We continue on. Verse 19. Now the rest of the acts of Joash and all that he did, are they not written in the book of the Chronicles of the Kings of Judah? We have that. We'll be studying it next. And his servants arose and made a conspiracy. A sad statement. Servants arose, made a conspiracy, struck down Joash at the house of uh, Milo as he was going down to Selah. For Jazakar, the son of Shemiah, and Jehozabad, the son of Shomer, his servant, struck him, and he died, and they buried him with his fathers in the city of David. And Amaziah, his son, became king in his place. Chapter 13. In the 23rd year of Joash, the son of Ahaziah, king of Judah, Jehoahaz, the son of Jehu, became king over Israel at Samaria. Now our attention is turned to the north. Jump to the north in your minds. And he reigns for 17 years. And what's the, what's the word about him? Well, he did evil. That tells us here in verse 2. He did evil in the sight of the Lord. I love that phrase, by the way, in the sight of the Lord. The Lord sees, the Lord knows, and therefore before his eyes do we live. And it tells us that he did evil in the sight of the Lord. The Lord saw the whole thing. And he followed the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, with which he made Israel to sin, and he did not turn from them. What were the sins of Jeroboam, do you remember? He had made golden calves, one in the north, the north-north of Israel, and one in the south of the north of Israel, that they should go to worship at these golden calves rather than to go to Jerusalem. And God says, that's not what my heart was at all. And so he calls it the sin of Jeroboam. And in fact, when you go to Israel, uh, and I hope that you get to go, when you go to Israel, one of the places that you commonly go to is one of those very altars. It's still there today. It's an interesting thing. The altar that Jeroboam set up in the north is still there. And you go there, and it's really a testimony of a lack of faith in God's word. And it's still there today. Going back to our, our study, verse 3. So the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel, and he gave them continually into the hand of Haziel, king of Aram. So victory wasn't there. They got defeat. But this is an interesting story. For there is a turn that we don't expect. It tells us, remember verse 2, he did evil in the sight of the Lord. And therefore, the Lord gave them continually into the hand of Haziel, king of Aram, and into the hand of Ben-Hadad, the son of Haziel. But notice this. Then 
Jehoahaz entreated the favor of the Lord, and the Lord listened to him. Now, i got to tell you something. I love that. I love that because it just shows us how, how the Lord is so ready to receive, to forgive, to make clean, to start fresh. And so what happened was, here's a guy who's doing wrong things, and he, he turns his heart and he starts to seek favor. And it tells us that, verse 4, Jehoahaz entreated, asked for, begged really, the favor of Jehovah. Yahweh. And we say Jehovah here because that's the name of God. The God of Israel has a name. It is Yahweh or Jehovah. And he says he, he asked the favor of Jehovah. And the Lord listened for he saw the oppression of Israel how the king of Aram had oppressed them. And the Lord gave Israel a deliverer. Literally a savior. A deliverer. Who's our deliverer? Jesus. He is our deliverer, our savior. And so the Lord gave Israel in the north a deliverer, and they escaped from under the hand of the Arameans, and the sons of Israel lived in their tents. There was a victory. There was a strength because he had turned his heart. And I think this is wonderful, you know, because if, if anyone is making bad decisions, they're going down the wrong path, just one decision after the other, bad decision, bad decision, bad decision, bad decision, and they get to the point where they say, I can't do this anymore. I'm so sick and tired of my own sins. Lord, I'm turning to you. Please, could you forgive me? You know what the Lord says? Of course I'll forgive you. Of course I'll forgive you. I'll receive you back right now. Based on the blood of Jesus Christ, the sins have been forgiven. I love that. Because, you know, God is not a man that he should hold a grudge. Do you know what I'm saying? I love that picture of the Lord. The, 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 the heart of restoration Jesus has paid the price on the cross. And so the restoration, the forgiveness, when we come to him and say, Lord, I entreat your favor. I repent of my sins. Lord, I'm asking for you to touch my life. Oh, yes, I receive you right now. Right now. I just love that. Because, you know, God's not like us. You know how we are. Well, I don't know. I'm going to think about it. And you really made me mad, you know. I just love that. The restoration of the Lord, the forgiveness based on the blood of Jesus Christ. And so, it tells us, nevertheless, in verse 6, and oh, when we turn to the Lord, we really must turn with all of our heart. Because there, there are degrees of relationship, and he wants the depth of it. He says, nevertheless, they wouldn't turn away from the sins of Jeroboam. They wouldn't get rid of those golden calves. Get rid of those golden calves. Is there something in your life that you just can't get rid of? Get rid of those golden calves with which they made Israel sin. They walked in those things, and they left the Asherah there too. So, verse 7, he left to Jehoahaz. <laughs> I can say that, really. So he left to Jehoahaz of the army not more than 50 horsemen and 10 chariots and only 10,000 footmen, for the king of Aram had destroyed them and made them like the dust of the threshing. Now, the rest of the acts of Jehoahaz and all that he did and his might, are they not written in the book of the chronicles of the kings of Israel? We don't have that book. That book. And Jehoahaz slept with his fathers, and they buried him in Samaria. And Joash, his son, became king in his place. Now, in the 37th year of Joash, king of Judah, Jehoash, the son of Jehoahaz, became king over Israel in Samaria, and he reigned 16 years. These names are so familiar. I mean, similar. And he did evil in the sight of the Lord, did not turn away from all the sins of Jeroboam, the sons of Nebat, those golden calves again, with which he made Israel sin. He walked in those. Now the rest of the acts of Joash, and all that he did in his might, with which he fought against Amaziah, king of Judah, are they not written in the book of the chronicles of the kings of Israel? His record is pretty short. So Joash slept with his fathers, and Jeroboam sat on his throne, and Joash was buried in Samaria with the kings of Israel. Now, our, our attention is turned to Elisha for a moment. Now, Elisha became sick with the illness of which he was to die. Now, Joash, and we're kind of jumped back in time a little bit, back when Joash was alive. So, Joash, the king of Israel, came down to him and wept over him and said, Now, this is an interesting phrase. 
So when Elisha is about to die, Joash, we go back in time a little bit, he comes down to him, he starts to cry over him. Remember, he was the one whose heart was pretty right. So he says, my father, my father, the chariots of Israel and its horsemen. You recognize that phrase? It should, if you've been with us for a bit, it, you should recognize it. This is the very exact same phrase that Elisha himself used when he was with Elijah, the great prophet before him, as he was taken up. Jo Elijah didn't die, remember. He was taken up. And the chariots and the horsemen are what separated Elisha from Elijah. So he called out, my father, my father, in exact same phrase, the chariots of Israel and its horsemen. So here comes the king, and he quotes the same verse. He quotes the same statement. What's he saying? The strength of Israel. The strength of Israel. Elisha, we need you. We need you. We need a prophet of great might in this land. So Elisha said to him this. Now, this is an interesting story. Take a bow and some arrows. So he took a bow and arrows. And then he said to the king of Israel, put your hand to the bow. And he put his hand on it. Then Elisha laid his hands on the king's hands. Then he said, open the window toward the east. So he opened it. Then Elisha said, shoot it. So he shot it. Now, he's given us all this detail. He opened the window. He's standing inside the, the room. And he opens the window, and he takes his arrow, and he shoots an arrow right up through the window towards the east. He shot it. And then, this is what Elisha said. The Lord's arrow of victory, even the arrow of victory over Aram. For you shall defeat the Arameans at Aphek until you have destroyed them. Then he said, now take the arrows. And he took them. And he said to the king of Israel, now strike the ground. And he struck it three times. And he stopped. And the man was angry with him. And he said, why did you only strike it three times? You should have struck five or six times. Then you would have struck a ram until you would have destroyed it. But now you shall strike a ram only three times. Well, what is this about? It's about the heart. And so he said, take the arrows and strike the ground. And so he kind of went, which is to say what? Half-heartedly. That's his point. That's what he's trying to say. Strike the ground with it. What, what are you? The Lord is giving you an illustration here. The Lord is giving you a sign and a signal of something great. Now pour your heart into the thing, man. You strike the ground. He said, you should have, when, when the Lord instructs you to do something, you should do it with all of your heart. Boom, 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 boom. You just strike that thing with the zeal of the Lord. I said, this is a picture he's trying to give him. You strike at that thing with the zeal of the Lord. You know, there's a phrase in the Bible that is used several times. It says this, the zeal of the Lord will accomplish this. We'll see this very soon. And it's in several different places in the scriptures. The zeal of the Lord will accomplish this. You know what it says? The Lord has zeal. The Lord is zealous over us. The Lord has zeal in his heart, and therefore he's saying, so I want you to have zeal in your walk. I have zeal for you. I have zeal after you. The Lord rejoices over us with singing. The Lord has zeal for you. How much does the Lord have zeal for you? The Lord says, so much zeal that his son was even on the cross demonstrating God's love for you. How much zeal does he have for you? And therefore, when the Lord calls you to something, you have zeal. See, is the Lord calling you to something? I want you to take the arrows and strike them to the ground. And you can just almost see the, the Elisha. What, what are you doing? When the Lord tells you to do something, you do it. You demonstrate the zeal that you have before the Lord. Amen? There's a right lesson in there for us. And he said, now you see, you just did it half-heartedly. You're not going to see the blessing of the hand of the Lord in it. And there's, you see, what is he saying to the zeal of the Lord? Put your faith right on the front of the line. Put your faith, trust in the Lord with all of your heart. Don't be afraid. God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of love and of power and a sound mind. Put your faith right on the front line. And when he says, do something, you do it. There's a picture for us to understand. 
Verse 20, Elisha then died and they buried him. Now this is an interesting story. Now the bands of the Moabites would invade the land in the spring of the year. And the, as they were burying a man, behold, they saw a marauding band. So they just threw him into the grave. They just threw him into the grave of Elisha. When the man touched the bones of Elisha, he revived. He was a dead man. He was thrown into the bones of Elisha. He revived and he stood on his feet. A demonstration of the power of the Lord. Now, one of the things we need to see is that there in the north, this is where this was taking place, right? There in the north, they had, for the most, for the largest part of it, they had walked away from God and turned after all the gods of permissiveness. There was Moloch, there was Baal, there was Ashtoreth, there was, and on and on, they were going after the gods of permissiveness. And yet God was demonstrating his power, his hand, his heart, sending prophets. Even while their hearts were hard, God was sending after them the prophets and the message of his power. You know, I, I love that because that's what God does to us right now. And Elisha was that demonstration. Elisha was the demonstration of God's power and God's heart and God's call to come back, to be reconciled. And so this is important for us to see because if you ever get to a place where you're walking away from God and, and, and you're walking out in the world, you've got to know that He is on your trail. He is on your trail. He is all over it. And you're going to find Him reaching out to you, reaching out to you, reaching out to you. And you can't shake Him. He's the hound. I love that phrase. He's the hound of heaven. He is on your trail. And he is, he is going to just keep demonstrating to you his love after you, his love after you, his love after you. You won't be able to shake him. And sometimes he'll demonstrate to you the discipline, the discipline, the discipline. Why? Because if he loves, he says, those whom he loves, he disciplines. He's reaching out to you, he's reaching out to you, he's reaching out to you. And so there is that picture for us to see. This is another one of those, that, man, the power of the Lord was demonstrated. This, the, the, the word of this went through, you can imagine as it just spread. Elisha, man, the prophet, you won't believe the power of the Lord was so mighty upon him that, they, that there was this marauding band and they, they just threw the guy's body into the grave and he, he woke up. Wow. Let's go worship Moloch. Are you joking? Do you see what he's, uh, you know, that's the point. Verse 22, now Haziel, king of Aram, had oppressed Israel all the days of Joahaz, but the Lord was gracious to them and had compassion on them and turned to them because of his covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and would not destroy them or cast them away from his presence until then. When Haziel, king of Aram, died, Ben-Hadad, his son, became king in his place. Then Jehoahaz, the son of Jehoahaz, then Jehoash, the son of Jehoahaz, took again from the hand of Benadad, the son of Haziel, the cities which he had taken in war from the hand of Jehoahaz, his father. Three times Joash defeated him and recovered back the cities of Israel. Chapter 14. Now in the second year of Joash, son of Jehoaz, king of Israel, Amaziah, the son of Joash, became king of Judah. He became king. Let's turn our attention to the south. So now we're going to the south. Now he was 25 years old when he became king, and he reigned 29 years in Jerusalem, and his mother's name was Jehoiadin of Jerusalem. And he did right. He did right in the sight of the Lord, but not like David. So he did right, but not quite like David. He did according to all that Joash his father had done. Only the high places were not taken away. The people still sacrificed and burned incense on the high places. By the way, what were the high places? The high places weren't worship to some other god. They were worship to the Lord, but not as the Lord had instructed. The Lord said that they should go to Jerusalem, and he gave them the specifics of how they should honor the Lord through the priests and what they should bring and when they should bring it. It was all prescribed for them, now, why was that so important? Because all of those things which God had prescribed were pictures of Jesus Christ. And by faith, they would begin to see the prophecy of it unfolding as the, as the prophets would reveal it. They were pictures of Christ. They were anticipations of Christ. And pictures of a greater truth 
the Son of the living God. But so when they went out and they tried to honor God their own way, well, okay, they honored God, that's fine. But they didn't do it the way God had asked them to do it. Therefore, they were missing out on the fullness of God's blessing because God had a purpose in it. And I think this is important because there are, are many people who, who just basically say, you know, I'll, I do want to honor God, but I'll do it my way. I'll make my own rules. But you see, God says, what do you mean you make your own rules? I already gave you a Bible. I already gave you my word. He says, walk in that. Walk, there's a reason for what I set forward. There's a reason for what I set forward. And so don't make up your own little, I want to honor God my own little way, and, and forget the fact that God already gave to us the light unto our path. Amen? What we need is humility. A humility that says, God, your word is sharper than any two-edged sword. It is alive, it's living, it's active. And you give your word for a reason. And therefore, I come in submission to your word. I'm not going to try to stand over your word and make it do what I want it to do. I stand in submission. That's the heart that God wants. And so whenever we read this, you know, they, they, they kept the high places. It's not that they were going after Moloch or Baal. But they really didn't listen. And that's the point. They really didn't listen. And that's the point. Now, it came about, as soon as the kingdom was firmly in his hand, that he killed the servants who had slain uh, his father, the king, making things right, bringing justice. But the sons of the slayers he didn't put to death. Now, this is an interesting. But the sons of the slayers he didn't put to death. Well, why not? Well, because according to what is written in the book of the law of Moses, I love that part, as the Lord commanded, saying, The father shall not be put to death for the sons, nor the son shall be put to death for the fathers, but each for his own sin. Good. He killed of Edom in the valley of salt 10,000 and took Selah by war and named it Jachtil to this day. And Amaziah then sent messengers to Joash, the son of Jehoahaz, son of Jehu, king of Israel. So here's this king of the south. He sends messengers to the king of the north, saying, Come, let's face each other. Now, that means let's, let's face each other in battle. He's calling them out. Now, why? We don't know, and it really wasn't advisable. So Jehoash, king of Israel, sent to Amaziah, king of Judah, and said, Now, the thorn bush, which was in Lebanon, sent to the cedar, which was in Lebanon saying, give your daughter to my son in marriage. But there passed by a wild beast that was in Lebanon and trampled on the thorn bush. you get my drift? He's trying to give him a message. You're just a thorn bush. Don't be messing with the cedar. You have indeed defeated Edom, and your heart has become proud. Enjoy your glory. Stay home. Why should you provoke trouble so that you, even you, should fall in Judah with you? And, and actually, God hadn't told him to do it. So he's taking it upon himself. Why are you going and attacking your brothers? Why are you doing that? God didn't tell him to do it, and it didn't work out well. Verse 11, Amaziah would not listen. So Jehoash, king of Israel, went up, and he and Amaziah, king of Judah, faced each other at Beth Shemesh, which belongs to Judah, and Judah was defeated by Israel, and they fled each to his tent. Then Jehoash a son of uh, a king of Israel captured the king of uh, Amaziah. The king of Judah was captured, and the son of Jehoash, the son of Amaziah, at Beth Shemesh, and came to Jerusalem, and he tore down the wall of Jerusalem, from the gate of Ephraim to the corner gate, about four hundred cubits, and he took all the gold and the silver and all the utensils which were found in the house of the Lord and in the treasuries of the king's house, and he took hostages also, and he returned to Samaria. That was unadvisable. Now the rest of the acts of Jehoash, which he did, and his might, and how he fought with Amaziah, king of Judah, are they not written in the chronicles of the kings of Israel? We don't have that book. So Jehoash slept with his fathers and was buried in Samaria with the kings of Israel, and Jeroboam, his son, became king in his place. And Amaziah, the son of Joash, king of Judah, lived 15 years after the death of Jehoash, son of Jehoahaz, king of Israel. 
Now the rest of the acts of Amaziah, are they not written in the book of the Chronicles of the kings of Judah? We have that book. And they conspired against him in Jerusalem, and he fled to Lachish. But they sent after him to Lachish, and he killed him there. Then they brought him on horses, and he was buried at Jerusalem with his fathers in the city of David. All the people of Judah took Azariah, who was 16 years old, and made him king in place of his father Amaziah. Now, if anybody has all these names straight, I will give you a great prize. (laughs) Because these names are getting complicated. He built Elath and restored it to Judah after the king slept with his fathers. Now, in the 15th year of Amaziah, the son of Joash, king of Judah, Jeroboam, the son of Joash, king of Israel, became king in Samaria, and he reigned 41 years. And he did evil in the sight of the Lord. He did not depart from all the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, with which he made Israel to sin. What was that? The golden calves again. He restored the border of Israel from the entrance of Hamath as far as the Sea of Arabah, according to the word of the Lord, the God of Israel, which he spoke through his servant Jonah, the son of Amittai, the prophet, who was of Gath Hefer. For the Lord saw the affliction of Israel, which was very bitter. And there was neither bond nor free, nor was there any helper for Israel. And the Lord did not say that he would blot out the name of Israel from under heaven. But he saved them by the hand of Jeroboam, the son of Joash. Now, that's an interesting verse. The Lord did not say that he would blot out the name of Israel, now did he? Kind of important for us to note that. The Lord did not say that he would blot out the name of Israel, because many people believe that the ten tribes of the north were forever lost. I submit to you that God kept a remnant for himself, Why? For the Lord did not say that he would blot out the name of Israel from under heaven, but he saved them here by the hand of Jeroboam, the son of Joash. Now the rest of the acts of Jeroboam and all that he did and his might, how he fought and how he recovered for Israel, Damascus and Hamath, which had belonged to Judah, are they not written in the books or the book of the chronicles of the kings of Israel? We don't have that book. And Jeroboam slept with his father's even with the kings of Israel, and Zechariah, his son, became king in his place. Let me pray. Father, thank you so much as we just read through these accounts. Lord, we understand there's all kinds of confusing names, confusing things and places, but Lord, we know this. You were sovereign over everything that happened, and we're so thankful that you have demonstrated to us your heart. As we read through these things, Lord, we discover treasures, jewels, wisdoms, things that encourage us, things that reprimand us, things that help us to understand that your heart to bless us is ever more readily there. And I pray that, Father, we would understand that you have called us to be a people of great zeal. And I love that particular story that we were reading with this king who was just half-hearted, just kind of half-heartedly going with what God had called him to do. Lord, help us to be a people of zeal. For you are a God of zeal. And Lord, you want us to be a people who are zealous before you that we would love you. We would have passion for you. We would be a people of great faith committed wholeheartedly to you. And Lord, help us when when we walk and and, and, and move by the things you've called us to. Lord, help us to not just kind of be so-so in our walk, but Lord, with all of our heart, walk before you. We love you and thank you for all that you're doing in us, how you're calling us to a right relationship. Church, as we're praying tonight, I don't know where you are in the Lord, but I, I know that there are some even here tonight who have been, can I say it delicately and graciously, perhaps You've been half-hearted. And and God is saying, but I want you to be a man or a woman with some zeal in your heart after the things of the Lord and after the Lord himself. And so if you're here tonight, and that really is you, you know that the Lord is, is touching your heart and is saying to you, 
I've called you to be a man or woman of zeal. And I want you to be that now. I want you to live and move and have your being with all faith, trusting in God through the troubles, the trials, and the difficulties of your life, and be half-hearted no more. Would you respond to the Lord in that and say that to him with your heart? Lord, I don't want to be that way anymore. I want to surrender to you with that humility, that teachability of heart. Would you say that to the Lord? Just lift up your hand in all boldness to him. He'll see your heart. He'll know your desire, and he'll meet you here. God bless you, God. God bless each of you as you would say that before the Lord. Father, we're so thankful that you are so ready to restore. You are so ready to forgive. You are so ready to demonstrate the greatness of your love. We walk in that now and love you for it. In Jesus' name, and everyone said. On behalf of Calvary Chapel Worship Center and Pastor Rich Jones, we thank you for ordering this message. Our prayer is that God will use it in your life to increase your knowledge and your love for Him. If we may serve you in any way, please contact our church office at 503-642-2003 or on our website at www.calvaryhillsboro.org. On behalf of all of us at Calvary Chapel Worship Center and Pastor Rich Jones, May God bless you.